The Blessed Eucharist, Our Greatest Treasure by Father Michael Muller Chapter 15 The Most Holy Sacrifice of the Mass Before speaking of the Most Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, I must first explain to you what it is meant by sacrifice. A sacrifice or oblation, in its most general sense, is anything that is offered to God. In this sense, a sacrifice may consist of the internal emotions of the heart, as Holy Scripture, for instance, calls a contrite heart a sacrifice to God. But in its strict sense, a sacrifice is an offering to God of some sensible object to acknowledge by the destruction or change of this object the sovereign power of God and his absolute dominion over all creatures, as also to render him the homage due to his divine majesty. All nations have agreed upon the propriety of making such oblations to the being to whom they they give supreme honor. The Holy Scripture, the most ancient of all histories, tells us that Cain and Abel offered sacrifices to God soon after the fall of our first parents. At the time of the deluge, we find Noah offering clean animals to God, and the same was often done by Abraham and his his posterity. Now, how are we to account for general and agreement of mankind about this mode of worshipping God? Reason alone must convince man of the necessity of expressing, in some external way, his obligation of dependence on God. We are composed of soul and body, and as we know that God has a right to the services of both, we cannot be satisfied until we have given an adequate expression to the emotions of our heart. It is not very probable, however, that natural reason dictated the particular series of oblation which has been in use amongst most nations. I mean animal sacrifice. For, although the sense of guilt which has weighed upon all men ever since the fall of Adam would naturally have suggested to them the necessity of some expiatory offering whenever they were about to approach God, yet we cannot see why they should have chosen to sacrifice an animal for that purpose. On the contrary, the offering to God of the life of a harmless creature in expiation of the sins of men, considered apart from divine revelation, would seem to be even absurd. It is therefore most probable that God himself instituted animal sacrifice in the beginning of the world to foreshadow the meritorious sacrifice of Christ and to give a man a means of acknowledging his guilt. Now, domestic animals have been generally chosen for sacrifice, chiefly for two reasons. First, because they stood in the nearest relation to man, and consequently were the most fitting substitutes to bear the penalty which he had incurred. And secondly, because, by their gentleness and innocence, they served to represent the meek and spotless Lamb of God. However, this original revelation concerning animal sacrifice, of which we find traces among all nations, became very much corrupted in the course of time. Supposing that that which they loved and prized the most would be the most acceptable offering to God, men went at last so far as to sacrifice their fellow men, nay, even the lives of their own children. Of course, such sacrifices were in the highest degree hateful in the sight of God. In order, therefore, to teach men how to worship him properly, the Lord chose a particular people, to whom he gave express and minute directions about the sacrifices that they were to offer. This was the Jewish nation. Out of this nation he chose a particular family, the family of Aaron, who were to offer him sacrifice. These sacrifices ordained by God were of various kinds, offerings of adoration, offerings of impetration, sin offerings, and thanksgiving offerings. In some of these sacrifices the victim was only partially consumed by fire, while in others it was entirely consumed. The latter were called holocausts or burnt offerings. This system of worship lasted until the coming of our Savior. It was then abolished because all these sacrifices were in themselves utterly incapable of appeasing the wrath of God. They were meritorious merely because they prefigured the death of Christ. Consequently, after that event, these sacrifices became entirely unmeaning and worthless. Ever since the death of Christ, there has been no bloody sacrifice, for the death of our Lord was the true propitiation for the sins of the world. The prophet, however, expressly foretold the institution of a new kind of sacrifice, a real sacrifice, though an unbloody one, which was to succeed in abrogated sacrifices of the old law, and to be offered unceasingly in every part of the world. The passage to which I allude is very remarkable. It is from the prophet Malachi. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, addressing addressing the Jewish people, and I will not receive a gift of your hand, for, from the rising of the sun even to the going down, my name is great among the Gentiles. And in every place there is sacrifice, and there is offered to my name a clean oblation, for my name is great among the Gentiles, said the Lord of hosts. Here we have the promise that, When the Jewish sacrifices should have ceased, another and far more precious sacrifice should be offered, visible indeed like them, but unlike them possessed of an intrinsic sanctity, and a sacrifice that was to be offered from the rising to the setting of the sun, a sacrifice that was to be offered in every place, even to the end of time. Now all these attributes were found and found only in the Catholic sacrifice of the Mass. 
This is so evident that all the fathers of the church, with one accord, interpret this passage as a clear prophecy of this most adorable sacrifice. It is a real sacrifice in the proper sense of the word, because our Lord is not only really present in the consecrated host, but he also truly offers himself to his heavenly Father. It is not, however, a bloody sacrifice, because our Lord is not really slain in the Mass. His death is merely represented in a mystical manner by the separation and destruction of the species. According to some of the Holy Fathers, the word Mass is derived from the Latin word Misa, or Missio, which signifies a sending, because God sends his well-beloved Son to be our victim, and the priest sends him back to the Eternal Father as our ransom and our intercessor. But you may ask, does it not argue a want of perfection in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross to continue thus to offer himself in the Mass? By no means. The sacrifice of the Mass is the same that was offered on the cross, the only difference being in the manner of offering. The victim is the same in both. It is Jesus Christ, the true Lamb of God, really slain on the cross, mystically slain in the Mass. The priest, too, is the same. It is Jesus Christ, the true High Priest, who offered himself immediately on the cross, and who offers himself immediately by the mystery, by the ministry of his priest in the Mass. In itself, the sacrifice which our Savior offered on the cross is of infinite value, and it is more than sufficient for our redemption. But of what use will it be to us unless it is applied to our souls? Of what use is it to a poor person to know that there is somewhere a sum sufficient for his ransom, if that sum be not really given to him? Cardinal Hosius gives a beautiful illustration of this truth. Suppose, he says, that there were in a certain city a large fountain of water, sufficient to supply the wants of all the inhabitants. Suppose that this fountain was situated in the center of the city, and entirely open to all. Will the mere fact of the existence of such a fountain be sufficient to supply everybody's wants? Must not everyone that stands in need of this water either draw it himself or have it brought to him by some means or other? Now, there is a fountain of living water flowing from the open side of Jesus Christ. It is a never-failing fountain, a copious fountain, sufficient and more than sufficient to wash away the sins of the whole world and to impart life to all the children of men. In order, however, that we may experience the wonderful virtue of this living water, it must be applied to our souls. Now Jesus Christ has established certain channels through which the waters of his grace come to us. Baptism is one of these channels, the daily sacrifice which we call Mass is another. By this sacrifice, the fruit of the sacrifice accomplished on the cross and the precious blood there shed for us are applied to our souls. How unjustly, then, do the Protestant ministers reproach us with obscuring the sacrifice of the cross by our daily sacrifice of the altar? Would it not be absurd to say that to desire baptism and to place one's confidence in water instead of in the blood of the Redeemer would be to disparage the merits of Christ? Now, just as absurd is it to say that we, by our daily sacrifice, obscure the glory of the sacrifice of the cross and detract from its dignity, since we, by this very means, only participate in the sacrifice of the cross and make it available to our salvation. Moreover, our divine Savior instituted the sacrifice of the Mass in order that his religion might not be wanting, in what even the Jewish religion possessed a continual sacrifice, and that we might have an adequate means to worship him properly. The sacrifice of the Mass, therefore, far from derogating from the sacrifice of the cross, only brings it nearer to us and renews and extends its effects in a wonderful manner. Our blessed Lord instituted the sacrifice of the Mass at the Last Supper. On the very night in which he was betrayed, he changed bread and wine into his body and blood and gave to the apostles and to their successors the power to do the same in commemoration of him. In obedience to the commands of our Lord, the apostles frequently offered up the holy sacrifice of the Mass, as we see from the Acts of the Apostles, and from the writings of the Fathers of the Church, especially of St. Ignatius, Martyr, and St. Clement, both disciples of the Apostles. The wooden altar on which St. Peter and the succeeding popes down to St. Sylvester used to say Mass is still preserved at Rome. St. Matthew, the Apostle, was pierced with the lands in the very act of saying Mass. When St. Andrew the Apostle was required by the tyrant Aegeus to sacrifice to the gods, if he wished to escape the punishment of the cross, he replied, I daily offer up on the altar to thee the only true and almighty God, the Immaculate Lamb, which, though it is consumed, remains always living and entire. And indeed, St. Paul expressly declares in in the epistle to the Hebrews, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat who serve the tabernacle. An altar implies a sacrifice, since an altar is used only for sacrifice. Now, as there is no other sacrifice in the Christian religion than that of the Eucharist, it follows that the altar of which the Apostle speaks must have been an altar for saying Mass. The fathers of the Church commonly speak of the Mass as a solitary sacrifice. St. Cyprian, in the 3rd century, calls it an everlasting sacrifice, 
St. Augustine, in the, in the 4th century, declares it to be a true august sacrifice, and that it has supplanted all former sacrifices. But no one has spoken of the subject in more sublime terms than St. John Chrysostom. O wonder, he exclaims in his homily De Sacra Mensa, at this table, so magnificently furnished, the Lamb of God is immolated for thee. There the cherubim are present, there the seraphim attend, there all the angels join with the priest in praying for thy welfare. And again in his book, De Sacrificio, he says, When thou beholdest the Lord immolated and lying upon the altar, and the priest bending over the sacrifice and praying, and all the assistants reddened with that precious blood, dost thou think that thou art still on earth? Does it not rather seem to thee that thou art wrapped into paradise and beholding with the eye of thy soul the things that are done in heaven? In his 83rd homily, he says, How surpassingly pure ought he to be who, saw, who offers such a sacrifice? Ought not the hand that divides the sacred flesh, the mouth that is filled with the spiritual fire, the tongue that is dyed with his most sacred blood, be purer than that the light of the sun? Think how thou art honored, to what banquet thou art admitted, that before... That, before which the angels tremble and veil their faces, is our food. We are united to Christ. We are made one body and one flesh with him. Who shall declare the power of the Lord and set forth all his praises? End of part one, chapter 15.